I'm going to begin now. Uh, I'll keep the poll up during the introduction just in case we get anyone else uh, to hop on. But good evening, everyone, and welcome to Redefining Herstory, a conversation on the underrepresentation of women and girls in society and challenging gender norms. This event is presented by the Community Diversity Group, the Borough State College, and the Youth Service Borough. We are delighted you are here with us today. My name is Natalie Versillo, and I will be your moderator for this event. I currently work and play in the Office of Community Engagement in the Borough of State College. I'm dedicated to fostering an inclusive and welcoming community for all. Prior to this position, I worked at Center Safe, a domestic violence and sexual assault resource center serving all of Center County. Proactively working to end violence against others, specifically women, is something I was work I've been working towards my whole life. Looking at everyone attending here today in the Zoom reassures me that there are others who are here proactively working to create an inclusive and equitable community. Thank you for your hard work. It does not go unnoticed. The panelists for the event were chosen based on their expertise and the diverse hats they wear in the community. On that note, it's important to take an intersectional approach to feminism when discussing this topic. An intersectional approach to feminism acknowledges that while women share similar experiences of discrimination, harassment, sexism, inequality, and oppression on the basis of their sex and gender, not all women are equally disadvantaged or have equal access to resources, power, and privilege. An intersectional approach to feminism requires analysis and action that is not only gendered, but considers how other forms of systemic oppression and discrimination, such as racism, homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, and ableism can intersect with the impact on women's experiences of gender, inequality, discrimination, harassment, violence, or abuse. I'm not great at articulating words, uh, so that definition was, definition was provided by the Domestic Violence Resource Center of Victoria. Now, before I have the panelists introduce themselves, I wanna mention a few things about the format of tonight's event. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. Please turn off your camera if you would like or rename yourself on the screen. The chat option is turned on for today's event. Please ask your questions via the chat or utilize the raise hand functions function at the bottom of your screen where the button reactions is. And you can do this at any time. My trusty co-host, Ian Kuiper Marquez, thank you, Ian, <laughs> will help me monitor the chat as well as letting others into the room as he's been doing this whole time, thank you. Um, I'm a big proponent of silently letting panelists know you agree or appreciate their perspective on a topic. In order to keep the chat mostly for questions, we encourage attendees to utilize the heart emoji or the clapping emoji under reactions, or simply fanning yourself when what someone is saying resonates with you. For example, Ian can talk about, he thinks ice cream should be a food group. I would do this because I agree. Ice cream is awesome. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Some House Rules. I will now ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with my dear friend and past colleague, Sarah McPherson. Thank you, Natalie, and thanks for hosting this event. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah McPherson, she, her, hers. I'm currently a program manager with a national organization called End Rape on Campus. It's based in DC, but I'm remote, so I get to stay here in Central PA. I, as Natalie said, I worked with her um, for three years at Center Safe, um, doing prevention and education work. So I've been doing sexual assault, domestic violence, prevention, education policy work for the last seven years since I got my master's um, in social work at Baylor University. I also teach for Baylor University's online master's program. I just had classwork before this, so talking about community practice work. Um, I'm here in Pine Grove Mills. I've got a almost seven-year-old, almost three-year-old, 
Um, so doing that mom thing, lots of plants, and yeah, looking forward to the upcoming holidays. And I think I pass it along. Haley, how about you go? I saw that one coming. I knew it. <laughs> but um, I'm Haley Roan, um, pronounced she, her, hers. I work at the Youth Service Bureau um, here in State College, um, Center County YSB. Um, I just graduated from Penn State in May of 2021. Um, but I have three years of experience uh, working at YSB and I obtained that through work study and on and off part-time work study, now full-time. Um, I have experience running small groups. Um, I specifically work in prevention. So drug and alcohol, bullying, um, gambling, but we do more than just that. We run um, homework clubs, LGBTQ plus groups for youth in schools. We bring programming to where youth live. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. I'm from Northeastern PA, small town Susquehanna, Pennsylvania. Y'all have ever heard of it. Uh, right up there next to the New York border, the Poconos. And I was the panelist that had a cat. Well, I will let Sue go next. All right, thanks, Haley. <laughs> I'm Sue Marshall, she, her, hers. Um, and yeah, I assume you read my bio. So I, I would say I'm the oldest person on this panel, but I'll say I bring a lot of wisdom instead of age. And um, I, uh, after retiring from the school district, I was a counselor at the high school for 34 years. And now I have uh, a private college counseling, very small business. And I spend um, a lot of time doing LGBT training in the community. I um, sit on and was one of the founding members of the Center LGBT Support Network, which is a nonprofit. Um, I also spend time on the Center County Community Conferencing um, nonprofit now, because um, I'm a trained restorative practitioner. So I, uh, I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for the invitation to be here. And um, I typically, I'm at my best when I'm either on my bike or I'm out in my yard. But I'll try to be on my best tonight too. So Nathaniel, do you wanna go next? Sure, hi everybody. Thanks so much for being here and for having me. My name is Nathaniel Skemmelhorn. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a current PhD student at Penn State um, University Park Campus in social psychology and women, gender, sexuality studies. I am, I guess now halfway through my fifth year um, out of six total. My research focuses mainly on masculinity and how masculinity creates power differentials between different individuals, but also between different groups and how we uphold gender stereotypes and how we uphold masculinity through systems such as politics, through education um, and, and other structures in our social, political, economy economic world. Prior to coming to Penn State, I was a middle school teacher. I taught seventh and eighth grade English in Florence, South Carolina for four years, but am originally from Massachusetts. I tried to get into a bunch of different hobbies during work from home and failed at all of them. I'm looking at my dead plants and I have embroidery in the drawer that's never been touched, but I did train as a group fitness instructor over the summer. And so now I teach in town at Photology um, right next to the high school. So, yeah. And I think Ian. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Kuiper Marquez. He, him, his. Um, I'm just going to be in the background uh, co hosting for Natalie, monitoring your chat. Um, I'm the Prevention Services Director at Center County Youth Service Bureau. Um, and I work also a member of the Community Diversity Group. Uh, my work focuses around um, prevention, much like Haley said, but also uh, we run a lot of small groups with uh, young men and women and LGBTQIA+. So my focus is always uh, mm. D&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as breaking down some of the harmful notions that of masculinity that boys have often put onto them. But uh, tonight I'm here in support of these great panelists and Natalie, and I will be, you'll see me in the chat active and around. So 
welcome and enjoy. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, um, this event is actually part of a series, two part series. The first part was on toxic, toxic masculinity that was moderated by Ian. Uh, so thank you panelists for being here today. I'm so excited. I wanna let attendees know, please put in questions in the chat or raise hands at any time to ask a question. I am gonna begin the discussion with a question that's been lingering on my mind since watching, watching the film, Misrepresentation. So, and anyone um, of the panelists, if you'd like to answer, just give me a little holler um, and I'll call on you. And whoever, whoever wants to answer one question, all questions, go for it. <laughs> so, please describe some gender stereotypes you've experienced in your life or aware of from media? What are the positive and negative effects of these stereotypes? How do these stereotypes of femininity, femininity and masculinity limit everyone, especially children? That's a two-parter. I love two-part questions. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah, Nathaniel, thank you for your cute little hand raise. <laughs> So I think I can start off talking a little bit about how gender stereotypes are really rooted in this binary nature. And so all of the stereotypes are going to inherently create opposition. So masculinity is everything that femininity is not. And we societally put more emphasis and more value on masculinity. So we are inherently devaluing femininity along the way. And so some of the major stereotypes that are related to masculinity are agency, power, control, um, and those that are related to femininity are the opposite. We see more warmth, um, sensitivity, empathy associated with femininity. And not only are we prioritizing men and masculinity in society, but we're prioritizing all of the stereotypes that go along with this. So to be powerful is to be good in our society. To be agentic is to be good, to have control, um, to have competence. And so the more that we sort of just naturally reinforce this in our everyday lives, the more these stereotypes become embedded and the more we prioritize men and masculinity over women and femininity. And as you saw in the film, um, there really is this sort of mind-body split. And historically, the mind has been associated with competence, with agency, and with men, whereas the body has been more associated with femininity and women. And, women. and that's how we get to this place of over-sexualization and focusing on women's bodies rather than their competence and their agency. And we see this starting super early, even in small ways. So there, there's some psychological work that took a look at preschools and saw that preschool teachers even unconsciously are doing things that reinforce this sort of body is to women as mind is to men. So one of these examples is that obviously preschoolers are going to be playing, roughhousing, they want to have fun, they're running around, and preschool teachers were much more attuned to fixing girls' skirts or fixing their clothing and making sure that they were neat and their appearance was fine, whereas they were much more uh, they allowed the boys much more autonomy over this sort of play. And so we even see this reinforcement at very, very young ages that just becomes much more obvious and much more ingrained in ourselves as we age. Thank you. I love having an academic on the panel. <laughs> Anyone else want their perspective in that question? Thanks, Sue. It's all you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I won't, I won't be the academic, um, but I, I'll give you a, a, what I've experienced or what I see. Um, so I've been coaching girls cross-country track and field for over 30 some years, and um, I still coach cross-country. And I've always coached girls. And it's interesting. Um, it's interesting that I have, over the last 10, maybe 12 years or so, um, it, 
we've always had to give the women's team permission. Uh, and we're talking about high school students. So they're ranging from 15, 14, 15 to 17, 18. Um, we've always had to give them permission to go and beat people. Um, but I see that becoming more and more necessary um, over the last 10 or so years. Um, really, uh, I, we must be, as a society, clearly um, teaching our young people um, that identify um, it, as female not to go and beat people, um, but to be kind and caring. And um, so when they're out there racing, you know, if somebody's injured or one of their teammates is not having such a great day, it's really hard for them to pass them and run their own race. Um, and they really seem to need permission to do that. Um, or to be told that's okay, that's, that's, that's competition. It's okay to be competitive and it's okay to win and it's okay to want to win. So um, I don't know, that's just a little anecdote that I see playing out year after year. Thank you for mentioning that, Sue. Uh, if I remember correctly from our masculinity event, sports was a very hot topic as well. So it's very interesting to see um, compare and contrast, just the gender stereotypes surrounding sports. Sarah, you're up next. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts. And, you know, as you mentioned, the importance of bringing an intersectional lens to this. So when we think of stereotypes on genders and sex, there's also added layers of what that looks for folks of different races and colors and um, ability levels, class levels. Um, so when we think like women's, Black women's bodies and how they are, you know, often modified as well and over-sexualized even more so. And even the features that Black women have had through history have changed and their value and how they're seen by others and how a lot of times these days trying to be replicated by um, other folks. And, and the ideas of, you know, how we talked about the stereotypes, um, stereotypical traits of men being powerful and in positions of power and strength and things like that. Yet also for Black men, as an example, Black men can't be too strong or too powerful or they're a threat. Um, there's a really great book, Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele, I believe, and it kind of talks about stereotypes of all different types and how um, there's an anecdote in there of how um, white folks or other people would be crossing the street when there's a black man walking down the road and just the different ideas that come to mind um, when we think of and see and stereotype different types of people. Um, <clears throat> and you can see you know, how that would impact everybody impact um, children, certainly. And I think the, the impact on kids with stereotypes of, of any kind is really meant to uphold the status quo um, of who is in power in, in our society, because the stereotypes are designed to teach kids and people to perpetuate these ideas um, that women and girls are more second-class citizens um, and that the boys and the men are in charge. And yeah, the you know, misrepresentation gets into that idea, certainly. Um, and I think a, a broader stereotype that we, we can see is that there are only two genders rather than the fact that gender is more of a spectrum. And, um, that it's, it doesn't have to be in opposition to what is feminine, what is masculine. Um, so just some thoughts to throw out there as well. Thank you, Sarah. Sounds like we need a third part to this series then, talking about the spectrum um, that you just discussed. Does anyone else, anything to say about this question? Um, if not, I will open the floor to attendees to ask questions. Um, if not, I have more, don't worry. 
And like I said in the beginning, um, please please utilize the chat to ask questions, or if you want to raise hand, raise your hand. Um, Ian and I will hopefully see you and um, let you know. So the next question I have, I'll actually bring up the poll that most of you just took. So I'm going to share the results right now. Can everyone see the the poll results? For those of you, sorry if you came in late, you might have not had a chance to, to participate. Um, but the question was, in the United States, what percentage of women hold senior leadership positions? Uh, the statistic was taken from the Institute of Women's Leadership at Nichols College. Um, you can see the results we have. Uh, the options were 33%, 21%, 16%, and 24%. Um, as you can see, most people uh, here do not have faith in our country. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I wanna tell you that the correct answer was 21%. So not far off and still very low. Um, and that 24% is only the global average of women holding senior leadership position. Um, if you wanna think of this, uh, compare and contrast it, a country like China, for example, has about 51% of women in senior leadership positions. Um, so with that, I wanna talk about the glass ceiling. Um, for those of you that, that know, it's about the glass ceiling is, I guess you'd call it a theory, but basically about um, specifically to women and how they can break barriers in the workplace to, to level up to these uh, senior leadership, leadership positions. Nathaniel probably has a better <laughs> academic definition on that. Um, but on that note, are you surprised by this number, by the U.S. number, the China number, the global number of women in leadership positions, and why or why not? Sorry, did I? Okay, Nathaniel and Haley. How about Haley? We'll go first and then Nathaniel. Sorry, I, I like unmuted myself for a second because I keep forgetting to raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so actually, uh, I had a great conversation um, with one of my friends about this question. Uh, we watched the documentary together and we kind of discussed after um, what we thought about the statistics and all of that. But um, one great point that she mentioned was that even though China does statistically have that 51%, um, it's kind of women being in power there is almost kind of like a facade. So even though they do have women in all these different kinds of positions of higher political power, when it comes to the women actually making these decisions, they have very little say in what actually happens. So like how China wants to be ahead of everybody, every other country, they wanna be up on top. It's kind of them strategically placing women in power to really show that they are in fact advanced when it comes to having the upper hand in that department. Um, some like other great examples would be Denmark, uh, New Zealand, other European countries that have had women in power in higher positions for decades, not decades, but around a decade or so where they actually influence, um, you know, where they live and the decisions that they make. Thank you, Haley. That's a very good point. Um, it makes me think of too, like, we see all these companies and organizations want to hire women and, and people of color but they don't want to promote us. So <laughs> definitely think about that if you're head of an organization or company. Nathaniel, how about you next? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, in terms of the United States, I'm not surprised by the low number. Um, and I think that one of the things that they talked about in the documentary was backlash that women receive as they go up the latter from not only men, but importantly, also from other women. Um, and 
not only the glass ceiling, but I'd also like to introduce the idea of the glass cliff, which is when women are put into leadership or powerful positions following some sort of crisis in that organization. And therefore, it's a win-win for the company because they look like they are doing something really good. Um, or they're look, they look like they're diverse. They look like they are putting in putting women in um, powerful positions, but really they become a scapegoat following a sort of crisis. And I don't know exactly um, the timeline. I should know my Penn State history, but I don't. I think that an example sort of close to home was when Sandy Barber was hired as the athletic director amidst scandal, that was a question of, is this going to be a class cliff situation where we are now becoming more diverse in our athletic department, but is it really just to sort of clean up crisis and then move on? So that's also something that is happening behind the scenes um, that I think that we should be aware of in addition to the daily backlash that women receive um, for getting promotions and being leaders. Thank you, Nathaniel. I've learned a new term, the glass cliff. I will be texting my group chat after this, asking, let's talk about this, because that's very interesting. I really appreciate that. And Penn State example, too. Um, Sheen Ma has a question in the chat. Sheen Ma, I saw it. We will come to it after we hear Sarah's perspective. So thank you for asking the question. And when I think of, is this surprising or not, I think about um, how the policies in place in the United States um, largely don't support women, um, mothers, especially in being in leadership positions or in the workforce at all. Um, things like the cost of childcare, the paid leave for parents, um, cost of healthcare, inequity between wages, um, the sexes, these sort of things often impact women in the workplace. And you can think about the impact of the pandemic and um, just seeing articles coming out and NPR stories about um, how the pandemic has impacted women in the workforce. Um, I saw something about one in four women um, had been considering leaving the workforce, whereas it was one in five men um, because of the pandemic and amongst women that those that were most experiencing challenges with the pandemic were working mothers, women in senior management roles, and Black women. And yeah, there's just a lot of conversation about employment and the workforce in general right now. Um, but just knowing in order for women to move forward into leadership positions, there has to be support at all levels, at the organization, with federal policies. Um, so that's another consideration. Thank you for bringing that up, Sarah. Um, I am not a mother, but I did fan myself when you said that, because I have so many friends who are full-time working moms like yourself, and to see them have to go through the pandemic with everything else that's going on, and just to see that um, the federal government wasn't there to support them. And it, it really, you know, makes me think about my future if I want children. Um, I know a lot of you too are mothers here um, in this, this um, meeting too, and probably have a lot of perspective on that as well. So if we're done with this question, I'm going to move on to the next one. I believe this question was a follow-up um, about the the percentage of um, women in China in senior leadership positions. Shinma asked, what was the source of this perspective on women and power in China? That one's for me, right? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Um, so as far as the source goes, I can, my roommate is a history major here at Penn State and she, is really like deep into politics and she stays up to date with, she tries to stay up to date with every single thing. Um, but I will ask her about the source, she and Ma, and I will reach out to you and I'll let you know. I 
Thank you. We appreciate that. We love reliable sources <laughs> in a world where there's so many not reliable sources. <laughs> um, so if no one else has a question, I have another question um, in relation to the film misrepresentation. And so this one is particularly about media. I mean, of course, media has taken over the world um, in the past 20 years. And even so now during the pandemic, I don't know. I have no idea what we would have done without media or technology in general. But how do we overcome the media's negative messaging surrounding how women and girls should present themselves in society? How can we challenge these gender norms? And with that too, with um, talking about men and little boys, how, how, how does that negative messaging, you know, how do we overcome? Because it's always in our face. It's always going to be there. Sarah, if you would like to begin. Oh, I have a few thoughts. Um, so I think this also connects to the last question as far as who is in leadership, who's leading media outlets and organizations, who's, you know, writing the narratives, um, who's making the decisions about what stories are run and what films are produced and who's doing the makeup for the films and the lighting and all of this stuff. It all matters. Um, for example, there's recently a headline about um, Adele's concert and thing with Oprah that she did on CBS and the headline said Adele's Oprah concert proves she didn't lose her voice with those pounds. Um, I've seen this going around on social media and that's a trash headline <laughs> pretty much. Um, whoever decided that that should be the headline for um, an article, you know, which otherwise like praises the performance and things like that could be replaced by someone who understands the problem with that, the misogyny behind it, um, and a number of other things. So, you know, thinking about that. Um, I also really try and point these things out to my kids, like as a, as a parent, hey, did you notice how in this, the, the boys did this, or the girls did this, or, oh, it's only boys and girls, but we've talked about how there's other types of people. Um, and I've seen, um, you can get these stickers where you can, that they, you can put in um, into like some of your favorite loved books that you love, but are maybe not as inclusive or diverse. You can put stickers in that'll change pronouns and change some of the words so that they make them more inclusive like that, which is really cool. Um, but making sure, you know, we have diverse books in our homes and in our schools and in our preschools and daycares so that um, folks are getting, you know, from the, the young ages, just a much more diverse perspective. Um, and making sure that we're hearing as much as possible directly from the person um, telling the story, making sure that they have control over their narrative and how their story gets out there. Um, like we've been talking about Taylor Swift re-releasing her music and Britney Spears and um, all of these big examples that are in the media um, right now about that importance of having a say over our stories so that they're not portrayed or twisted in other ways. Thank you, Sarah. Autonomy within our own stories is very important. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Does anyone else have um, something to say about that question? I can repeat it too, because I know I was kind of stumbling on my words. <laughs> okay. Well, I have another question ready, unless the audience would like to ask anything at this time. Okay. I see Jolma, did I pronounce your name correctly? Thank you. 
Joma, please ask your question to our wonderful panelists. Um, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for putting up this um, webinar. Uh, it's, I'm finding it very interesting. Um, a Humphrey Fellow here in Penn State, and I was sent by my coordinators, so I'm very glad that they really shared this uh, meeting. Um, just uh, to comment a little bit on how we could, like, example me, how I try to defend myself when media is trying to put me down and sending all this negative message. I tried and I try to do that with my kids, my girls and everybody at home is to remind them about who they really are and not allow uh, the media or anything or anybody around them or in school or colleagues, anybody underestimate them or try to define them. Because I try to do that, like you have to know who you are. So you are not like, for example, you are not fat. You are elegant. Not everybody likes skinny bones. I try to like telling them and sometimes I say, no, not everybody likes someone with big bodies and things like that. So appreciation, because the moment that you know your identity and that you are just unique the way you are. And I try to tell them that uh, uh, if you are certain and sure and happy with yourself, that is like, 50 percent i think or 60 percent um that's going to help you overcome all this challenge because we don't have much power towards other people we can't force people to ap to appreciate us or to be grateful to us but we can do that to us it's like whatever if you think i'm like this this is how you think and i'm sorry i can't convince you of otherwise and i can't change your mindset but guess what I know who I am and guess what? I'm not wasting my time to convince you that I'm elegant and beautiful and loved and so forth. So that's more or less what I try to remind them um, uh, and how I try to fight back all this kind of um, stereotype and uh, that happens with the media. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Joma. Um, I know, like I said, I don't have children. I feel like it's probably very important for your children to learn that, not even that adults. I know I need that reminder a lot too, that I am strong, I am powerful. I'm probably showing my age right now, but I saw this tweet where <laughs> this a little girl told her mom, she put on a pair of pants and she goes, my legs are too powerful for these pants. I need new ones. And that just completely, <laughs> <laughs> blew my mind because if I was her age as a kid, I that's not what I would be thinking. Um, so I'm just very proud of mothers like you and this person on this tweet to, to, to teach their children that. So Haley, um, if you would like to, to comment on that, please do. So going off of what um, Jola and Sarah said, uh, when it comes to social media, um, when we possibly compare ourselves to others or we see what other females look like or we do self-comparison of other people's lives and what they're living when it comes to apps it might not seem like we have the power to control what we're seeing and what pops up on our news feed but we do have the power to control what we see um typically for tiktok for example um you can say you don't want to see this you know like you don't like this type of content and when you do that it's minimizes you actually seeing content like that again or so if you see videos regarding anything from being skinny fat shaming you know anything like that you can say I don't like this content and it's very less likely that you will receive that content again so really you can control what you see and it helps in the long run because even I don't like to compare myself to other people I see on TikToks or the apps or anything like that. But it's a hard trap to fall into, you know, when a video pops up on your feed and you're like, well, I, why don't I look like that? So really knowing that you have some power and control over what you see on these apps can really make a difference when it comes to using them. Thank you, Haley. That's a very good point. Uh, the, alg the algorithm is scary good. So we can use it for good. Hallelujah. All right. 
Thank you, Iris, for raising your hand. It's nice to see you again. You may ask your question or comment, whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> It was, it was more of a comment that I think, you know, um, when we think about our young women, um, they don't think that way, right? We do because we have the wisdom and the knowledge to go. We can, we can take this off, but media and, and school, like I joke, my, my niece is in high school now. She is um, very uh, active. She's in dance, she's in ballet, she's in hip hop. Um, but I will say as a biracial child, uh, I joke with her mom and says she's been blessed with the curves, right? And so she has curves, but she's learning about her, about my side of the family, right? And so you have the curves. Her mom's side of the family doesn't necessarily have the curves. And so some of that is genetic and it just is what it is, even if you look at social media and all these other things. And so it broke my heart when her mom reached out and said, my daughter feels like she's fat because, or she's big because all the other young ladies that she dances with, that she's been dancing with since she was a little girl, have all contained that same size. And, I, and I'm trying to you know, embrace and instill in her. So there's an extra level here of, of identity in a sense of um, ethnicity, race, and, and, and genetics, right? And so she's too young to really fully understand, you know, if I wanna say, boo-boo, listen, we got the hips, we got the curve, don't matter how much you wanna lose, you wanna gain, auntie you didn't had surgery, I still got my hips, right? Um, and, and you kind of got to accept some of those things, but she's too young to really fully understand that. What she sees is my dancers, my friends are all skinny, they're all smaller, or, you know, and, and that's considered to be healthy when in reality, they could be home doing things that are not appropriate, right, to have them be that size. And so I think that's the other part is we, on a more mature level, can, can decipher what that looks like, but it's challenging when you're talking to a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old who's also going through puberty, right, um, um, and developing that they don't understand that that's a part of the, the transition of your body. Um, um, you know, I know I was like that. I'm still like that to this day, that there's some things that I'm like, Iris, you just blessed with it, <laughs> right, but it took me a long time to get there, um, and so I'm, it's, I struggle with how do I have this conversation with my niece um, and have this conversation with her mom from a cultural standpoint more than just the identity of being a woman, if that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Thank you so much, Iris. And Anna, I see you raised your hand. Please question or comment, whatever you'd like. I'm actually gonna, I'm actually breastfeeding right now, but since we are talking about femininity, I thought, hey, I would just put myself on video. Um, so Sarah, I, I've been thinking a lot about what you said about, you know, the, the ways in which gender itself um, is moving towards a non-binary perspective and there's a lot more fluidity in, you know, in the roles that um, the term man and woman play. And yet I also think about the terms femininity and masculinity and the way in which those themselves are binaries that seem to not yet have a neutrality to them or a, an in-betweenness. And so what I'm, um, and, and I guess in my own views, um, that um, makes a difference. The way that language um, interacts with one's identity makes a huge difference. And so my questions to the panel are, you know, how has, how have, how has language made a difference in the ways in which you view your own gender or um, view your own masculinities and femininities and how have lack of words or lack of phrases really played a role in also how your identity has formed with regard to gender? Thank you for your question, Anna and Sparrow. Is there a panelist that would like to go first? I know we have another academic that asked a question, so, <laughs> so everyone must think harder. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nathaniel. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's a really, really good question. And I hadn't quite thought about it the way that you just put it, where we are sort of, we're not there yet, but we are becoming more open to sort of gender bending in terms of clothing, in terms of style and, and things like that. We're seeing people like Harry Styles and Billy Porter on covers of magazines wearing gender non-conforming clothes, but we're not, we're still identifying 
for instance, Billy Porter wearing a dress at the red carpets for the Oscars as being something feminine. There isn't yet that middle um, in terms of how we talk about this. So you may present not fully as a, a completely different gender or sex that you identify with biologically, but you still might be bending those rules and yet we immediately put you in one of those boxes, feminine or masculine still. And that is tricky to think about how, how do we start to break down that binary? They are very much connected, um, but even as we start to loosen the reins on one, it's almost as if the other is tightening. Um, perhaps as a reaction to maintain that binary structure that we've just become accustomed to and rely on to make assumptions about people. Um, so as it's, as it's elongated in one way, it's narrowed in the other. And I don't necessarily have an answer of how we start to fix that, but I think that that is a perfect point that the language has not kept up necessarily with the things that we are seeing. Thank you, Nathaniel. I just wrote down gender bending because another, I don't know if that is a term or you just made that up on the spot, but I love it. <laughs> I, anyone, people use it. I don't know if it's the perfect term, but it is, it is used. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. No, I've never heard about it till now. That's, that's great. Sue. Um, yeah, great point. Uh, Nathaniel, those are some really good points. And the same with me. I, I had not thought um, about that question in that way, because you're right, we, we've come so far with language with pronouns, for example. Um, and I just finished a training um, with the Pennsylvania Parks and Rec Society um, about LGBT topics like sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. And we talked a lot about that, you know, about how language is changing and how to use language um, specifically that's not, um, that doesn't follow that gender binary. You know, that in our regular day, we are trying to, to escape saying, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, instead, good morning, friends you know, so that there's language that is accepting of all genders. But um, yeah, it, it was a great, that's a great question because we possibly haven't, we have a lot further to go. Um, but there, I, I do, I do like that. Um, and I do feel uh, as a member of the queer community, I feel like language is super important and language is being used to move our um, move our issues forward and have conversations. The hard part about it is, is that language continues to change and people feel like they can't keep up with those changes. And so in a lot of my trainings, I just try to say, look, you do the best you can and let people know that you're trying. And if you're wrong, um, let them correct you and apologize and, and move on and know that that's what it is for now. And if you're unsure, ask, you know, so language plays a big role. Thanks for asking that question. Thank you, Sue. We appreciate how much grace you give people in your trainings. Um, I know as a cisgender woman, um, when pronouns started becoming you know, more prevalent, I, in my head, I'm like, well, why does it, why does it matter? Like people know she, her. And then when I think about it, by me putting my pronouns in my profile or my Zoom normalizes, normalizes that someone who may present as something else want to be referred um, or identified as something we may have not have initially thought of. So yes, very good question, Anna. Thank you. And Sarah had her hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna, you know, quickly say I, I wish we had a um, a young person, like a youth, <laughs> um, um, a younger person who may have some more insight into this question as well, because I think a lot of um, young folks, middle school, high school, are um, figuring this out more quickly. And right now, and I'd be curious to to hear from 
from someone uh, younger as well about how they're navigating these things. Okay, so I think Haley raised her hand because she is our youth representative for this event. Um, unless Ian, if you have something that's related, so I don't want to move. I just, too well, I don't. Ha I don't. I'm not going to answer this, but I do have a question in terms of language and age and demographic, and I'm going to follow up with Sarah's point, and then maybe Haley will answer it. Um, so I often, many times we go into spaces, right? And I've been through training with Sue. Uh, she was my first LGBTQI training here in State College. Um, but I, as we go into spaces with youth, over the last three years, I've seen this shift in language where, and I do study and I work and we talk about this stuff, but the youth have, their language has evolved to already encompass the stuff that we're as adults are struggling with in terms of pronouns and stuff. And I'm wondering, is it, is it that we're not doing the work or is this already becoming part of their, like this world that has already shifted because of the work that's happening now, have they caught up and they're continuing in, in the next few years, we're gonna see a total shift in the way we use language, especially around the terms of gender bending and and like do is there to me I think there might already be terms that encompass the way we look but I'm just wondering if it's like we're not as adults we haven't got there yet and our youth have already gone and surpassed us and we're not really maybe not listening to them that could be research for you academics in the room yes there will be homework after this event thank you Ian for bringing that up um, Haley, if you'd like to respond, um, please do. Yeah, no, going off of what um, Ian and Sarah said, um, language has definitely evolved so much. And the youth we work with, um, sometimes they they know like new stuff as soon as it comes out. Like it's amazing how much they know about terms and all the different kinds of words and language associated with being a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, but with that, it kind of comes like their need to classify themselves, to like check check themselves like in this box. But with that and with them being so young, it's almost like um, they're isolating themselves to just that one thing. So they don't feel like it's okay for them to change their mind when they decide that they might not be gay or, you know, they're not straight. Um, they have a hard time coming to terms with declassifying themselves. And um, it's just a struggle that I've seen the past few years just come up in that classification. They just feel the need to label themselves as something, even though they're not sure. Thank you, Haley. That's very important. And I know even as children and adults, you know, it could change how they want to identify themselves and that's okay. So. I'm happy that we have other um, individuals in this call who appreciate and notice that. Ian, you had your hand up? No, no, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sue, how about you? I just, I just want to respond to that, Haley. Um, that that's, you know, that's my experience has been um, in working all the years I did with youth um, in the in the queer community that you know, labeling was so important to them because it, it allowed them to find a home. They finally found a, something that described exactly who they were. Um, but in most of my conversations with those young people, they were very clear in that that label probably is not forever. That label just grabs me right now, but that's going to change. Um, when we would do presentations, that was usually the the first question was introduce yourself um, and they usually had a, a, some label assigned to it. And the second question was, is that label for life? And they would typically say, absolutely not because I know this is a journey. Um, and, and parents would often question why their child had to you know, 
put themselves um, a peg in a hole, you know, and again, it often came around to there was a lot of relief at in their research of at least finding something that spoke to them. And so that language in those labels can be really helpful, but but we need to help them know it's a journey. Thank you, Sue. Um, yes, and those labels too, always, you know, inherently like on resumes, whatnot, can be tied to bias and stereotypes. And if we just end the labels, I feel like we can be closer to more equitable, equitable world. Would anyone else like to comment or have a question for our panelists or for everyone? can be related to the film or or not that's okay too <laughs> okay well i do have another question um and it is related to the film um and the question was brought to by brought to you by one of our panelists um so they mentioned how this film is 10 years old um and i want to know um how have things changed in society now since the film was created, but also what would you change about the film? All right, Sarah, you're up. So um, full transparency, I didn't rewatch the film. I've watched it several times. We used to use this a lot in violence prevention work and talk about gender boxes gender boxes and things like that. I watched the 15 minute TED talk and kind of got a sense of some things that, you know, maybe could use some updating or that were a bit limited um, in, you know, the at least the 15 minute TED talk, if you were able to watch that. It really didn't account for intersectionality at all, which I think we all think is important in, important in this, in this session, you know, and, addressing the speaker's own privilege and perspective and limitations that might be there, which as we talk about the importance of um, media and who's making the content is something to consider. And I, one thing in that 15 minute TED talk was she asked, where have all the smart girls gone? And this question really didn't sit right with me um, because I think, of who and what she was likely assuming is a smart girl um, and that that is uh, probably a very narrow idea um, where she seemed to equate progress with a narrow view of like even modestly dressed or um, a well-behaved <laughs> you know whatever that is woman um, rather than what progress really should be or as we're talking about people being able to control their own narratives and so I was thinking about, um, you know, folks like Lil Nas X and Lizzo and Megan Thee Stallion and people who I don't imagine um, Jennifer Newsom might equate as being a smart girl or um, putting out a positive, good view of women or individuals. Um, and yet, um, to me, what I see when I see some of these other folks is someone who's in control of a business, of their body, um, of what message they want to put out there and portray. Um, and this brings up a lot around, you know, when we think about sex and sexuality, which is different from gender, but it's connected and I think is important here because a lot of what is in misrepresentation is um, the over-sexualization of women and women's bodies. Um, and I think getting away from that sex or sexualization is bad and more what are the images that we're seeing about what healthy relationships and healthy sex lives can look like. Um, that that's more important than not having, <laughs> ignoring that sex is a thing um, or 
you know, the, the different ways want to be seen and, and exist in the world. And I'd rather um, shift to, to thinking about, um, as we talk about media, the, the portrayals that we're seeing, having more consent represented, um, having people using condoms and things like that, not skipping over these important steps in what um, healthy relationships and healthy sexuality can look like. So anyway, I don't know if we're going there, but I took it there. <laughs> we just did. We just right. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you so much for that perspective, uh, Sarah. It's a very important point. Um, and I agree to change the narrative and um, this film is 10 years old, but there's definitely could be a lot more critiques to it. Um, if any other panelist has a critique to either the TED Talk or the film. It would be interesting if they, you know, redid the film and made it a little more broader. And yeah, had a, an intersectional approach to feminism too, because it, it didn't touch upon that um, as much as I would have liked. Is there any other questions from the audience or comments, questions or comments? Nathaniel. Yeah, I think, so I was trying to think about how to say this, but I, I wanna bounce off of what Sarah was just saying too, because I completely agree. And I think that's where re-watching it for this event, where my critique lied as well, that sexualization and sex are not inherently bad things. It's the way in which those things are used. And I think that I also wanna think not only about individuals, who has individual agency over their own sex and sexuality, but who has the agency over defining what is sexy and what is too much, what's overt sexualization and where are the boundaries and how are we defining these? More importantly, who is defining these? And I mean, gender as we understand it now is a very modern conception that is a direct product of colonization and a direct product of separating colonizers from those that were colonized and we have just kept that. And so the, the dominant understanding of what appropriate masculinity is, is completely based on white masculinity, white straight masculinity, and the dominant conceptualization of what, of our beauty standards for women are based on white women and white bodies. And so as we're thinking about reconceptualizing individual agency, we also need to reconceptualize who's controlling the overall narratives. And it brings to mind, I can't remember what it was called, but there was a documentary on Netflix about young girls. I don't know if they were cheerleaders or dancers, and I want to say it was a French film, but when it was brought over to the United States, the, the advertising was completely changed and made it look like a film that it was not. And there, there was an uproar about that. And so people were saying that it was a film glorifying pedophilia, but really it was a documentary showcasing the harms in this sexualization from an early age. And so I, I think that we also have to think about who's creating these narratives and how is the media, um, how is the media also pitting different people against each other in order to keep the status quo. I think that's really important. We need to look at places where the status quo is being maintained and who has, who benefits most from that. Thank you, Nathaniel. And Ian put the name of the movie or show called Cuties. And even the name um, kind of has a narrative around it. I think so. Does anyone else want to comment? Um, okay, if not, I do have one more question for our amazing panelists. Um, and I'm going to ask all panelists to answer if they can uh, to wrap up the night, unless it brings more questions, because we really dug kind of deep. <laughs> and I appreciate that. So my question is, the film encourages us, 
us to lift up women in our communities for being strong leaders. Whom in our community, in the media, and or in your life do you look up to be as to being a strong woman? In a sense, who redefines history for you? I gave you all time to think on this question. So hopefully you have it prepared. <laughs> Oh, oh, here we go. I can just go. And I, I invite folks here to like put anything in the chat too, if you wanna share. I think it's great to acknowledge and recognize folks and learn about different people. Um, I think about, I don't know, I don't have a succinct answer, but when I think like strong, I think vulnerable and growing and changing. And um, I really just wanna like recognize anyone who has, any woman, any person who has chosen themselves, their their worth, their value, their health, their mental health over the status quo or over being understood by others or accepted necessarily by others. Because I know how difficult that is and can be to, um, to choose yourself when I think especially for women, we are told we are in service to others, whether that's our kids or a partner or our employers or <laughs> the world. Um, so there's that. Um, and I also, you know, I always want to recognize any survivors of sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, harassment, things like that, where um, they have to, their leaders, they're strong, um, for themselves, their lives, their families, their kids, um, and experiencing some of the hardest things that a person can experience. Um, I've got like my heroes I look up to, like Ava DuVernay, who is a black woman director who does amazing work um, and just love everything she does. And, you know, Mindy Kaling, who puts out diverse stories. She has a new one called the sex lives of college girls or something like that. Um, so I'm curious to check that out and see, you know, what other um, representation we get there. And a number of authors, Ro Roxanne Gay, Ashley Ford, Glennon Doyle, some folks who hearing their stories and reading their stories have allowed me to better accept myself, my story, my journey. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, Mindy, Kaley, Mindy Kaling reminds us that women are funny. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> All right, Haley, how about you? I was gonna say I could go next. Keep forgetting about the raise the hand. <laughs> um, so growing up in like, um, as I stayed at a small town, I didn't really have a lot of women to look up to in like higher positions. Um, so really when I came to college and now working at YSB, I saw more women in power and more women that were getting things done. Um, so really I just, I look up to the women um, that I work with at YSB um, and all they've accomplished um, in their fields and how, how they've grown and what they've done and accomplished and everything that I hope to achieve one day, you know, so. Thank you, I agree. As a woman in the workforce, I'm always looking for mentors. So line them up, <laughs> all of you that are here. <laughs> Would a panelist like to go next? Sure, I can go. Um, so yeah, Sarah and Haley kind of said some things that I'm thinking. Um, I, when I first saw that question, um, because Natalie had shared some questions with us ahead of time, um, I really thought about young people, honestly. Um, yeah, I have a daughter that's 26, and I spend a lot of time hanging out and coaching um, teenagers. Um, and I just 
that that those are the those are the people that I um, really respect. Um, all all of all of the damage that my generation and older have done um, and have allowed to continue, and all of the awareness that I see um, a lot of young people coming forward with is just fantastic. Um, and to help help them see that and nurture it and grow it. Um, you're right. I can send you some people for you to mentor, N Natalie, um, because that it's fantastic. And, you know, I, I, I'm glad I'm not in high school again, um, because it's scary hard. And especially with media and the media being in their hands 24 seven. So, um, yeah. That's who, that's who I thought of. Thank you, Sue. You do have so much wisdom. I appreciate you so much. Would anyone else like to go? I'll go. I think um, I am personally indebted for my academic career to all women advisors who have helped me through every stage, both undergraduate, in between, because I, I taught in between and in graduate school. So Joanne Farver, Jennifer Overbeck, and my current advisor, Terry Vesho, who's here in town. Um, and I also, I really want to recognize as well trans women, particularly trans women of color, who experience such incredible amounts of violence, but also have really been positioned as scapegoats and have been used in uh, whose bodies, identities, and just very existence has been used in really terrible ways, particularly these past four years um, as a weapon. And so also trans women. Thank you, Nathaniel. I appreciate that comment. I guess I have a few to add. Um, all the women on this panel I look up to, Sarah, when I learned about your work and then I thought you got, a, well, I knew you got a new job, but I thought you left. I was like really sad. <laughs> and then I talked to Dr. Chatters, who is also one of my heroes um, and helped me mold. And she continuously, in a way, from afar, I think she, she mentors me in a way and gets me Ubin, but um, you, and I'm so glad you're still in the community because the work you do is very valuable. Uh, Natalie, I have a lot, I've learned a lot from you as well, like as over this planning this uh, event and talking. Um, Sue, you helped me really dive into LGBTQI work from your training that you came and did at YSB and it really helped me continue to grow and continue to serve. Um, but working in family and social services, um, I've learned one, there's not very many men that work in that field. And I'm lucky to be in an organization where all my leadership has come and my leadership training has come from women. And I know as well as my wife, seeing her in a, in a higher academic position and see the work she does and the mothers that do the work in powerful positions. Um, but like one woman that really has helped me find my footing as a leader and continue to show me that maybe nonprofit work is where the real work gets in and where I want to be has been Denise McCann. Um, and those of you who know, she's executive director now at um, Center Health. Um, but I think I have learned a lot of valuable leadership ex experience and tools from the women that have surrounded me. And it comes just not from the way I connect or react, but thank you all for all the work you do in the community. I really value it and I, I love to learn from you all. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we appreciate you work for the work you do for this community as well. Um, some of us may know public service is not easy at all. <laughs> and if anyone else 
<clears throat> who wants to holler, shout out anyone else. Um, like Sarah said, it's open to the attendees as well. If not, that's okay. All right. On that note, we're going to end a little early, 10 minutes back of your night. Um, I want to thank everyone for all of your insightful questions and your perspectives tonight. Oh, Anna has something to say. <laughs> oh, I just, sorry, I just, I actually wanted to, I know I'm not a panelist, but I wanted to tell, say that my, my inspiration for a strong woman has been this little one. Um, and I do think that it's because you see, you know, how before someone has been impacted by the media, before they've been impacted by terms that cause them to feel as though they need to be in some binary, before they're told that they can't be physically strong or smart, that, you know, the essence of so many children, boy, girl, and, and, you know, non-gender, you know, conforming is so strong. And so it's, it's like the, this, this little one that gives me the motivation to, to realize that change is possible because it's not not this, this conforming and violence is not natural, but has been placed on us and thus can be unplaced as well. So, um, I just wanted to mention that as well. She also muted me a few times. So there we go, strength. Oh, Sparrow is awesome. Uh, I really appreciate that. And it does, like I said earlier, there are some aspects that do give me hope to have children into this world because this world is very scary. <laughs> um, but thank you all for joining us tonight. I always love when conversations on topics like this happen organically and they're community driven like they were tonight. Um, I really appreciate, like I said, everyone's insightful uh, perspectives and questions. And I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much for joining us.